Very good, yes. Uh, our attendees are in and we're ready to go. It's all yours. Great, thank you. I'd like to call to order the March 15th meeting of the New Canaan Board of Education. Uh, first is to approve the minutes from the March 1st meeting. Can I have a motion? Jen, second. Deanna, all in favor? Bob, be there? Oh, okay. Um, actually, abstention, abstentions. Bob, I think that's you. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, okay, next up is to approve our agenda. I'd like to propose a few amendments to the agenda for this evening. Uh, one is under action items to add Sachs Middle School Tables donation from the Sachs PTC. We'll also be looking uh, at a presentation from the high school as well. And then uh, the second amendment would be following our executive session to reconvene for uh, two items. One is uh, discussion and possible action regarding communications from the Board of Education to the Town Council, Board of Finance, and Board of Selectmen regarding the BOE's 21-22 budget request. And the second is discussion regarding communication to the community regarding um, current status of our budget. So uh, motion to approve these amendments. Penny, second, Sherry, all in favor? Okay, and is there a motion to approve the revised agenda for this evening? Deanna, second. Uh, Carl, all in favor? Okay, great, thanks. Uh, comments from the public. To ensure the public's right to be heard, the board has set aside time during the meeting for public comments. Two minutes will be allotted to each speaker and a maximum of 15 minutes to each subject. If there's anyone wishing to address the board, please use the raise hand feature and Dr. Lutze will bring you over. Thank you. see James yeah okay James you should uh, be all set okay great thank you uh, good evening everyone uh, although I usually provide the science and the research this this evening I'd like to discuss just what our your plan is doing to hundreds of young children and their parents as you know our town has a lot of commuters that make the daily trek into the city and many of these people choose this town for its schools and what they thought was a family-friendly community Pre-COVID, teams of fathers and mothers leave the New Canaan train station every evening, making their way home to see their children, to maybe share a late dinner or a bath and a bedtime story. I was and will again be one of those parents who looks most forward to that part of my day. Maybe some of you remember the evening routines you shared with your children and how what seemed like just the day to day was so special in retrospect, but your start time proposal literally steals that part of the day from my family. It robs hundreds and hundreds of young children of that all important time with their parents. It reduces countless parents to weekend dads and moms. To meet the same sleep requirements you often quote, hundreds of children will need to be in bed by six or 6.30 to make their buses the next morning, likely never seeing one of their parents all week. Honestly, I can't think of something much crueler to do to a five-year-old then take one of their parents away from their daily lives. Or a plan that shows less compassion for working parents. But as crushing as it is for my family, consider what this means for the increasing number of dual income families that come to our town expecting a caring and supportive community. Instead, they encounter an administration and BOE that takes away what limited time they have with their children. And that is if they can find and afford childcare. Who does this to their fellow members of their community? Well, apparently none of the surrounding towns that have changed their times. As sad as what I described to you is, this is exactly what will happen to many. It is not a characterization, hyperbole, or theoretical. Please consider what you're taking from children, parents, and families with this plan, and spend the time to show that you care about our children and their well-being as well. Thank you. James, could you state your full name, please, just for the... Yeah. Oh my God, you don't know my name by now? <laughs> I, what, you, you must have my email in the block sender list then. <laughs> uh, For those watching, name, yes. huh? For those watching, please, thank you. Okay, my full name is James Yao, Y-A-O. Thank you. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't see anyone else. I'm looking. No, I don't think so. And um, Carl, just so you know, I just promoted your phone call over as well. So it should work for the audio. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Great. All right. Uh, so we'll move on to reports and recognition. First is a COVID-19 update uh, tonight with Dr. Lutze, the cabinet and Principal Wolek from East School. And so let me invite Chris and Maura to join us. There we go. And Maura's on her way, I believe. Yep, she's in. There you go. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you. As we have uh, been sharing each meeting for, goodness, feels uh, like quite a long time, I think since the spring, so we're probably coming upon, upon a year. Uh, we have a standing item for just COVID-19 update on the Board of Ed agenda. Uh, it provides us with an opportunity to talk a little bit about some things that are, that are going on, opportunity for the Board of Ed certainly to ask us questions. Uh, at, a, <clears throat> at this point, as you're well aware, uh, we started phasing back as close to 100% at our high school. We began Friday bringing back our seniors. Uh, they were back Friday and today. Uh, tomorrow, we bring back our juniors, we welcome them back Tuesday and Wednesday, and then ninth and 10th grade are welcomed back on Thursday. So after Thursday this week, we will be pre-K-12 at 100% um, you know, in the building. Now, we do still have some temporary learner, remote learners, temporary remote learners, and some you know, sort of um, committed and not temporary full-time um, remote learners. But for the most part, we're still, we're running, as last, last check was in the low 90% of students participating in person. Um, the transition from the 50% hybrid to the 75% hybrid now all in uh, was very helpful, I think, for our students, families, and staff to, again, continue to, to implement the mitigation strategies. So great report so far for the seniors upon their return, and uh, we, we anticipate the same from our juniors and, and then our ninth and 10th graders on Thursday. Um, it does mean when there are positive cases that are likely to be more quarantines because of the, you know, the, the balance between running as full capacity and maintaining that uh, social distance of six feet. Um, people understand that. And if when we have to quarantine this, um, as Faye would have it, as, when I sent out the announcement about bringing back the, the seniors and phasing everybody back in, that same day we had a positive case at Sachs and a positive case at one of our elementaries. And we had to quarantine a classroom at the elementary in a, a a team over at Sachs for a period of time. That's the reality of the world we're in. So we have the, the great news about bringing those kids back, uh, but we also have to be, just be grounded in the reality that when a positive case arises, we're still using those mitigation strategies. Um, so to help that, we're continuing with our cohorting of students uh, in the K-8, and we're looking for opportunities to loosen up a little bit. Uh, for instance, in the BPA, uh, the, some of the rules are changing based on some research about distance for students when they're playing certain instruments and things like that. So the addendums are changing a bit. We're looking at our practice. We're looking at can kid, bring kids into the gym for a period of time for PE class at the elementary and then moving them back to classrooms, things like that. So we are continually reassessing and evaluating what's happening, uh, get still grounding our decisions in the science and best practices, uh, but continue to make progress and to move on. And so uh, that's, I think, good news across the board. The, um, some folks have asked about the half day Wednesdays and we continue to find that those half day Wednesdays are an important sort of dimension to the whole system that we have in place, <clears throat> excuse me, recognizing that it can be challenging for some families with the youngest students. Um, our principals and others are looking at and talking about ways that we can put together some programming for uh, students and families that may be interested uh, to run in the afternoons on those half days right at the school for some students. And we have some possible ways to uh, supervise those with uh, some non-certified staff and to do some creative things. So we're working on a plan around that. We'll get that out to you soon. 
because at this point we do anticipate maintaining the half day Wednesdays, um, certainly through March and April, if not through the remainder of the year. Um, there, we've talked about it before. I know as a board that uh, it's the professional learning opportunities, the opportunities for um, our students to, uh, because they don't have lunch on that day, gives us a chance to really go through the cafeteria and the kitchens even more carefully than normal. Um, it also, we've heard pos- some lots of positive reports actually about sort of the balancing of those days and times and stress for kids and things like that. So um, there's lots of reasons that's the plan. And we are looking at doing some programming around it uh, to help out. And to, to, as again, as the spring comes and we'd be outside more, uh, we think there are quite a few more opportunities to do, do some things where that's concerned. Uh, can we stop for a moment and see if, um, I know Dr. Crenty may have uh, some things to share and what have you, and then we'll uh, share anything else out from the cabinet. And then Chris Amora will uh, take a half step back and give you the floor. Uh, as an opportunity to share a little bit about what's going on at East and uh, sort of how you you guys are managing and, and working through all of this. But go ahead, Thank you, Dr. Lutze. So I thought I would share some of the PL opportunities we've been providing to staff and administrators, not only in February on our full PL day, but certainly on the Wednesdays. In particular, I thought I'd focus in on some of the work we're doing with DEI, with the diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I just wanted to share a little bit about some of the people who've been coming in and working with our staff um, and our administrators and what they've been doing. So the first person, which is not um, an unfamiliar name to you, is Chris Lehman. And he's a literacy leader from Educator Collaborative. And he's met with our elementary teachers over a year ago. And he shared strategies on how to maximize student contributions during interactive read-alouds. Using a culturally responsive lens, he's had the teachers dive into the types of books they're not only using for read-alouds, but also sitting in our classroom libraries. Since then, the teachers have been sharing book titles and having ongoing conversations with one another about how they can integrate these into their classroom. Um, And we're considering bringing Chris back for one of our Wednesday afternoon sessions as a follow-up. Another person that we've also been working with is Dr. Mara Gottlieb. And she's the president of Talking Changes. And she presented to our SAC staff over a year ago and most recently presented to the high school staff. And Mara's presentation was on cultivating cultural humility. She discussed ways to create an environment where diversity and inclusion are celebrated, where everyone is welcomed and respected and people's individual strengths are recognized. Her approach asked us to strive for a deeper level of openness to others' experiences and the way they see the world. She asked us to see without judgment how our own experiences and identities impact the work we do and the value we hold. She was so well received by both of these groups that she'll be uh, presenting to the elementary staff in one of our upcoming Wednesday sessions. Another person that will be coming into our district is Dr. Andrea Hognesfeld. She's a professor in the Division of Education at Malloy College, and she teaches doctoral courses related to diversity, social justice, and equity. Before entering the field of education, Andrea was an English as a foreign language teacher in Hungary and an English as a second language teacher in New York City, and she taught Hungarian at the New York University. Andrea will be blending her work on equity and second second language acquisition as she helps us to explore ways to celebrate diversity and inclusion and to support students who are currently identified as English language learners. Those are ELL students and or who have exited from ELL. So through an asset-based approach, we will develop a deeper understanding of the stages of the language proficiency and walk away with some practical strategies on how to support our students who are English language learners. And she'll be presenting to our seven through 12 staff and then our K through six staff on March 31st. Um, Another person who's been working with us is Daniel Braunfeld and he's from Facing History and Ourselves. And he's been working with our social studies department at SAC since August. Um, Facing History is a nonprofit organization. And Dan has challenged our social studies teachers to examine our collective history and understand how it informs our attitudes and behaviors. In August, the session was focused on student voices. 
and it connected beautifully to the work that we've been doing on EI. The concentration was how do teachers build a classroom culture where each student feels valued and positive relationships are built. In November, he worked on contracting, what structures, protocols, and norms can encourage deep think thinking and respectful discourse where there are differences of opinions. And one of the strategies he taught the teachers was FOG, which is what are the facts, the opinions, and the generalizations. And it's really been helpful as teachers engage in some of the difficult conversations that they might have about our history and certainly even current events. In February, he worked closely with Mary Hanna and the department to look at our curriculum units and begin to have conversations about how teachers can humanize the curriculum to help bring in multiple perspectives. For example, in grade five, how do students learn about the voices of Native Americans and Africans living in Jamestown before the Europeans came? And then uh, in April, Debbie Irving will be presenting to administrators. Um, Debbie's an emerging voice in the national racial justice community and combining her organizational knowledge, classroom teaching experience and understanding of systematic racism, Debbie will be providing another perspective as we continue to learn about racial equity at both the personal and institutional level. Debbie is a graduate of the Windsor School in Boston. She holds a BA from Kenyon College and an MBA from Simmons College. And she's the author of the book, Waking Up White and Finding Myself in the Story of Race. So as we're working through some of these presenters, it's really helping to broaden the staff and the administrator's perspectives and to learn. And that's really the purpose of all of this this year. Um, the way that we're really impacting our students is we're continuing to do our connections at the high school, some lessons at the middle school, and like our morning meetings at the elementary level. So like most recently at the high school, there was a discussion in a connections class on understanding the words tolerance, empathy, and inclusion, and what these words mean to students and the high school community. And at SACS, there was a recent le lesson on ways that they explored one of their charter words, inclusion. And remember the charter words are the words that the kids pick that they wanna feel included. And they provided a lesson that focused on the negative feelings that can emerge as a result of not being included and ways students can be more inclusive of their peers at SACS. So we're just at the beginning of our work learning and studying. Um, and I thought it would just give you an update on where we are um, as it relates to one of our district goals. Thank you, Jill. Uh, and that, that dovetails really nicely with the, the Wednesday half days and the PL and the, you know, the things that we're doing with the schedule. Um, and I believe, like, for instance, Debbie Irving spoke in the community. I think she came with into the library, was, um, you know, has been in New Canaan a couple of times, other things. And I, I attended the Mara Gottlieb uh, presentation and really found it, it was very, it was excellent, very powerful and very well managed. And, you know, that's in large part, thanks also to your organization and your uh, your zoom skills these days so it was great but uh you know that is a uh, one of the blessings of being in a remote world that you have access to people who may not otherwise be able to uh to get to, to your staff right and be able to travel um while while joe was giving an overview i just want to share one more quick covid um direct covid related update and then uh, open it up for chris and, and mara uh, but the I mentioned before that we had to quarantine a team over in fifth grade at Sachs. And what we did with them was, because it wasn't the first time the team had been quarantined, we ran through our, some testing for those kids. And anybody who wanted to sign up for the testing was able to do that on Friday and on Monday. And we just got all the results back in and they're all negative. So that's all good news. So those students will be notified and invited back into school again tomorrow. So that's something we hadn't done before to test like that, but because it was a team that had been quarantined in the past, we thought that uh, we wanted to make sure there wasn't anything else going on. And we used the tools available to us to uh, test them, make sure they're good and, uh, and healthy and bring them all back. So those kids will, that's a fifth grade team and they'll be coming back tomorrow, so that's great. Um, now over at East, Chris and Maura have been doing a fabulous job as you can imagine. Um, and so Chris, why don't you give us an update, um, uh, for eSchool and I can set it up that you can share your screen if you'd like, or I'm happy to drive if that's easier, whatever you prefer. I can 
happy to share it. I'll just there. So good evening. Start there and just say uh, that Maura and I uh, are very, very pleased to be able to be here this evening to share with you a bit about our year here at East. Uh, just a few weeks ago, you heard from Mr. Kaskak and Mrs. Robinson over at South about the learning environments in our schools. And really across all three elementary schools, we've all been implementing uh, those mitigation strategies that you heard about, uh, mask wearing, plexiglass, uh, cohorting, um, the idea of repurposing space, using outdoor spaces. And you see a lot of that in these photos. Um, what we wanted to sort of expand on this evening a bit is how within this learning environment, we've also been in, in all three elementary schools, looking at tools and strategies that allow us to monitor student learning and adjust instruction. That's one of our effective teaching framework indicators that we know is always important, but particularly important this year as we're continuing to, to be fluid and flexible with our students. So what I'm speaking about here are what are called formative assessments. Um, and these aren't tests that necessarily come at the end of a unit or the end of a trimester. They're tools that are designed to be embedded in a cycle of instruction um, throughout a unit of study, even daily at times, to allow teachers to be responsive to student needs. Um, that could be to the whole class um, and whole class needs that they're seeing. It could be small groups. It could be individual students. It could be to extend students. It could be um, to support a student who might be struggling in a particular area. Um, and so these are tools that really allow our teachers to be fluid and flexible, um, which as I said, is always important in teaching and, and in schools, but it's particularly important this year. Um, so Maura, I'm gonna let you share a little bit about some of these tools in reading and in math. Thank you, Chris. So thank you for summing up just exactly what a formative assessment tool is. And, and as Chris said, they are a critical part to our, our teaching and learning cycle. So to, for tonight's purposes, I'm going to simply highlight a couple of tools that are used uh, regularly throughout our instruction um, to help teachers uh, be those decision makers in order to differentiate instruction and meet each individual learner's needs. One, um, the first tool I'd like to to share with you is a running record, and that is uh, a backbone of our reading instruction. This tool allows teachers to capture a reader's behavior in an authentic way. And what a teacher does is as a child is engaged in a book, um, as you can see, you know, an image here of a, of, of a young reader at, at their table, a teacher would pull alongside and have the teacher read, uh, the student read out loud. And as the child does in their their own book, then they're documenting that behavior. The teacher is noting every word read accurately. They're, if there's any deviation of, from that print, they make note of the error. The teacher is also recording, um, documenting the time in order to gauge uh, a fluency rate. And from that information, a teacher can gauge as to uh, the level of automaticity for that child. Uh, the teacher is also able to document um, how a reader is grouping words together in, in phrases. Are they word by word? Are they um, moving into advancing into a more fluent reader? Are they reading with expression? The teacher then, um, once they have that all documented, after they um, listen into that, they can engage the child in a comprehension conversation where the reader then is able to demonstrate their under level of understanding with the text. Um, after teacher then uses that tool, they're able to do an analysis of all of that information that they documented. They're able to get an accuracy rate. Um, and we have certain levels, if, if a child's able to read a text at 98% accurately, we can determine that that is a, uh, an independent level text. If it's you know within um, a lower accuracy rate, then the child is still approximating that te that text. But all of that information gathered, then a teacher is able to make decisions as to what is the next step for that reader. Um, it helps them be able to um, group readers together in small groups and even see trends across the whole class to determine next steps for whole group instruction. So that is happening every day in all of our classrooms um, 
And it really helps us make sure that we're meeting each and every student's needs as readers. Another tool that is, um, it can be used across all academic areas are exit slips. These are, for example, in math, if um, after a, a lesson, a teacher can put out an exit slip um, that might have a problem or um, a task that they ask the child to engage in, and they collect that information and it helps to inform the teacher as to how is that child taking on the concept skills being taught in that lesson or um, a, a, a recent series of lessons. Teachers also use checklists. Checklists are used, can be used in math, they can be used in science or social studies, and they are a great tool in, um, in writing as well. And the teacher is able to identify some skills or concepts that, that have been targeted over a you know, recent course of instruction, and they're able to gauge whether that, that those skills or concepts are present in that work um, and, and help gauge their uh, path towards mastery. So all of those, those are just a, a, a sampling of tools that, that are used in our classrooms every day. And it's really the heart of, of our teaching learning cycle. And it really helps teachers decide day to day how they need to shift that instruction to meet the needs, how to remediate instruction if needed, and if they need to extend instruction um, for those readers who show quick mastery and are ready for that challenge. So that is, happening all the time and that's how our teachers are able to really help our learners thrive. Thanks Maura and you know that's happening not only in our classrooms it's happening also for our remote learners as well. You know our staff are, are really making sure that all of these tools that they have available to them are also tools that they can be using to really monitor how those remote learners are progressing in their learning and how to adjust instruction for them as well. I do want to also share this evening, just uh, highlight some of the work of our special area teachers as well. So art, music, PE, um, library, our ICT, science as well. In our elementary schools, these special area teachers uh, have really done a tremendous job of delivering our curriculum in new ways to, to students. It's the skills and the concepts that are embedded in their units of study um, that, they've, that they've had in their curriculum, but they're having to deliver that curriculum in classrooms. So uh, the art teacher does not have her art room to bring classes into. We're not, we're just beginning to use the gym. I, I was able to, to get a quick photo at the end of last week, just as we opened it up, you see in the center there, uh, Mr. Singali back in the gym with some students. And, but throughout the year, our special area teachers have delivered this curriculum in classrooms and they have done a tremendous job of really being fluid and flexible with materials, finding ways to bring that robust curriculum into classrooms and still give students a very comprehensive program in their, their uh, specials area. So you see Mr. Zhao, one of our music teachers out even in the snow um, with students outside with his ukulele, um, just it allowed for a, a bit more music uh, opportunities there. You see um, our art uh, student in first grade with paint. Um, so it's not limiting what they can do in these areas. Even though it's in the classroom, our teachers are coming with carts of materials that they can use um, in the classroom. Um, these special area teachers are also um, contributing tremendously to all the work that we're doing across the school to continue to keep our community spirit going and alive, um, that sense of community in our building, our school spirit. You see Mr. Zhao's uh, eSchool Singers group. There's a, a Zoom photo of them in the lower left-hand corner. And that is a group of fourth grade singers that perform every year. But this year they are using Zoom to have their weekly rehearsals. And they are very excited that they have a virtual musical coming up this spring. So we're all eager to, to see that. Uh, we also have some photos here that show um, or speak to some of the community service work that we've done this year. We've been able to bring um, different speakers in through Zoom, you know, similar to how within professional learning, we've brought speakers in for staff. We've also been able to bring speakers in for our students. Um, and we had some different speakers speaking about community service organizations and Meals on Wheels came and presented and our art teacher has been following up with encouragement to children of different ways that they can contribute that gift of art to others through Valentine's in this case and the, the snapshot that I, I captured there um, for Meals on Wheels. Uh, in collaboration with our PTC, we've been able to maintain so many of those wonderful traditions that we have at East, but with a new twist. So you see in the center, our Veterans Day Assembly, um, it was held virtually 
this year. That's one of our kindergarten classes participating in it. We've been able to have our science fair. It was through Flipgrid. Uh, instead of a STEM night this year, we had a STEM week. So activities were available virtually and students were able to participate in them throughout the week. There were no time limits. So an, an activity could go on all evening um, and even come back to be brought back the following evening if a family so chose and could post um, what some of those projects looked like on Flipgrid. Uh, so we have been um, just so appreciative of all of the collaboration with our PTC to make all of this possible. And it really has kept that eSchool spirit uh, alive and creating new memories. They're, they're new, they're different memories, but they are very special memories, I believe, for our students, our staff, uh, and our families. So I do want to just close with um, sharing an excerpt from a uh, TEPL reflection at the mid-year from one of our teachers. And TEPL is our teacher evaluation and professional learning system. And it, it's a, a system that allows our teachers throughout the year to reflect on their practice, um, you, looking at, as I mentioned, uh, indicators of effective practice in the classroom. And that's at the beginning, the middle, and the end of the year. They're sharing uh, data with administrators. They're sharing their thoughts on how they're growing their practice. They're receiving feedback. They're also just reflecting on the year. And so at the mid-year, a uh, kindergarten teacher shared this, this particular piece of, of her reflection. And I want to share it because I think it captures the social emotional growth and connections um, that aren't necessarily measured by an assessment per se, but that we all know are so important and valued. Um, in this district and, and here at East. So this kindergarten teacher is, is part of her reflection said, when I first looked around my classroom in August, it definitely looked and felt different with all the mitigation strategies, masks, plexiglass, less furniture. I wondered what this year would be like. What I didn't realize then was that establishing and strengthening connections was still going to be quite possible between my students and with me. I first noticed the connections forming when we were out on the kindergarten playground and the kids went to one of their favorite places, the monkey bars. Over the next days and weeks, I began to hear them chant for one another as they gradually built up their endurance and strength to go across all the bars and then to cheer for one another as they reached the end. They were building friendships and a sense of community in which everyone mattered. Connections had been established, masks and plexiglass and all. So I just wanted to share that as a piece of um, really the, the growth that is happening in our buildings each and every day. And some of it we, we assess and we, we can capture um, and maybe in a photo and some of it is, is what teachers are feeling and seeing in their classrooms each day. We're very, very proud of all the work that's happening at East. We, Maura and I both thank the board for your support. Um, we thank our staff, you know, not only just our teaching staff, but custodials, the cafeteria staff, our bus drivers, everyone has really um, contributed to this team effort this year. Um, and we thank our, our students for their hard work and, and the families that have been so flexible, cooperative and patient throughout the year. I know thank we have you, other agenda items, but thank we're happy you. if there are questions to, to take any. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And um, just before we transition that, I'd only want to share one more brief you know, update with COVID, but Chris and Maura, your pictures are incredible. Great. Those are, they're so I, great. Brian, as a uh, proud parent of three East School alumnus, alumni, thank you very much for the presentation, Chris and Maura. Work hard, be kind. Best school motto ever. Good, best <laughs> life motto ever. Um, <laughs> Veterans Day is uh, Veterans Day celebration is always the best. And Mr. Zhao rocks. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so does. Well, so does Jacqueline. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, well, why don't we, yeah, let's, any questions or any feedback for Chris and Maura, and then I'll uh, share my little, quick little vaccination update at the end, if that's right. Any other comments or questions? I, I was just going to say, I was, you know, so impressed and just, it was a very heartwarming presentation and just, you feel the connection. You just really brought it to life and just, um, it's really wonderful to see how robust and complete of an educational experience um, our youngest learners are getting this year, um, including the extracurricular and the school spirit and the, the, the message you sent at the end. So thank you for all of your incredible work and to all the teachers and staff at eSchool. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Carrie? I just wanted to add on, Christine and Maura, um, in my opinion, uh, you, all of the teachers and administration are true heroes um, for everything that you've done. I know we just passed kind of a somber one year um, anniversary of when our schools closed. And, you know, I think it's caused a lot of reflection on a lot of people. And, you know, we, we've lost a lot, but we've learned a lot. And thanks to you and your incredible work and leadership and sacrifices, both personally and professionally, our kids have not been educationally disadvantaged during this time. And I think as you so aptly showed, Christine, you know, some of the, some of the processes and practices are different, but still special. Um, I wrote a note to the administration this weekend about at the high school they did, they handed out cookies with the note, you know, COVID bites, let's make it sweeter. And those types of things are not going unnoticed by the board, by the parents, by the students themselves. Um, and just truly, um, your heroes forever. <laughs> and from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sherry. Well said. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Vaccines? Yep. Um, and I'll just add um, briefly, I wanted to share with the board. The last two Wednesdays, we ran our vaccine clinics. At this point, every staff member who's wanted one has uh, had the opportunity to get their first of the two shot sequence. Um, we we hit about a little around 700 people um, in the district, and then we had a number who were already vaccinated for a variety of different reasons and things. So it was very well attended, uh, very positive feedback, and. Um, it's a great step forward for, for the district and for schools, you know, all throughout Connecticut, really. Uh, so then we look for 20, it's 28 days after the first shot that you get the second. And then two weeks after that, you're considered uh, fully vaccinated. And the CDC recently put out its rules for fully vaccinated people, uh, which I included in my most recent email. So I, don't, I won't run through them here unless you have questions about it, but we're excited about it. And uh, right around spring break is when the next round of uh, the vaccines will be distributed. So good progress there too. And if I could just add a big thank you again on behalf of the board to all the nurses and the local community members, our physicians and everyone who showed up and just made everything. I heard it just ran so smoothly and I know there was a lot of enthusiasm and excitement and um, for great reason. Uh, it was, it, so thank you on behalf of the board to everyone who was involved. And I didn't mention, most importantly, our health director, Jen, who I know has been behind this whole effort from the start. And she's she's been getting ready for this this week, these last couple of weeks for a long time. So um, we really, really appreciate it. And I know it's a, a powerful moment to, to have getting, be getting ready for that second vaccine. Sherry sure, mentioned before how the timing is sort of, we're all sort of being prompted to reflect in different ways. And the... Uh, I was thinking just the other day how it was in April that the, when the EOC was meeting every day, we started talking about how to do mass vaccinations and what that might look like. And if you'll recall, we started doing some mask distributions at different times. And part of that was, and some mass testing. Part of the thinking behind doing it was certainly to get the masks out and to do the testing, but also to try some different scenarios to figure out the best way to do large scale vaccinations. And uh, we ultimately went, wound up going to Lapham and using that, that facility. And uh, this is, you know, it's a long time coming. And it was thanks to the foresight of our health director, Jen, and, uh, you know, other members of the EOC who helped to get us to where we are. It's really been uh, an amazing sort of progression and evolution to be a part of. Oh, sure. Sure, go ahead. Um, so congratulations. It's such an a wonderful accomplishment. And I know I have my vaccine appointment, so I can share in the excitement. Um, and I know Governor Lamont just announced today that he believes everyone 16 and up will be vac vaccinated starting April 5th. So they're actually now moving on a very accelerated schedule, which is very exciting. Um, I guess my question is going forward, um, if we've started to think about uh, what the protocols will be for any um, students or staff who opt out of vaccination. Sure, well, just at a high level right now, um, the some of the rules for the CDC that have changed include fully vaccinated individuals who are close contacts do not have to quarantine. 
uh, it, it speaks to fully vaccinated individuals who are with other fully vaccinated individuals indoors uh, can do so without wearing masks. Um, so, you know, as we continue to learn and understand sort of what the rules and expectations are, uh, you know, 16 and up is exciting. Uh, but, you know, as a school system, for us, we really need three and up, you know, to, uh, to fully protect. So we're still working out what the specific um, sort of protocols will be. But we know that uh, it's the, that quarantine expectation is a very is a big one. Uh, because one of the real challenges for school districts was staffing. If you had multiple staff members who were quarantining at different times, we had, uh, there were times where we were very worried about say, any one individual function, whether buses or cafeteria or others. So the getting the vaccinations helps with that. Um, but there's, we, with all of it, we have to balance the HIPAA rights of individuals and what we um, are entitled to know and not as as an employer and as a school district. And in that regard, the, uh, the attorneys are still working through the answers. And then just a follow-up question to clarify. So you mentioned earlier that there was a class who quarantined and because they'd quarantined before you uh, offered up the COVID testing and then it, it sounded like in effect, they were able to test out of that quarantine. So I just wanted to clarify if you're now you know, providing those exceptions going forward, or if this was just a one-time, you know. Testing. So this was a, a, a very uh, a different case in that the this was the third time this team. It was actually a fifth grade team was quarantining, and um, there were multiple cases among on the team in the past. And so when a new positive case uh, arose, we made the decision to quarantine the entire team. Although that may have been. If it were a different circumstance, we may not have, but we did, given the history already with the other positive cases. But since it was a very conservative decision, we, we decided to treat it um, special, especially by allowing them to take the test. And as of um, tomorrow, it would be nine days from mm, eight days from the potential exposure instead of the 10. So we just accelerated a little bit by providing the testing. Uh, and we also wanted to make sure there wasn't what you would call sort of a silent spreader in the room, right? That um, there wasn't somebody who had it, but didn't, wasn't showing any symptoms, who was uh, sort of causing some problems there. So great news that they're all negative. So that, that potential has been dealt with or the possibility has been uh, proven not to be. Uh, but it's, we're not going to wholesale, wholesale change the quarantine rules at this point, um, because really... The CDC says in extreme circumstance with several restrictions, you can shorten it with testing, uh, but it's only with those severe restrictions. So we've already gone from 14 to 10 days and we're gonna stay with the 10 days. Uh, but one change that we have made is around travel for April break, which you probably saw in the letter, uh, which in the past international travel was a mandatory quarantine regardless of testing. And now we're pulling that back and saying that international testing and domestic or travel and domestic travel alike will follow the governor's orders, which is you can test out of that quarantine uh, upon return or, you know, within 72 hours of returning to the state. So we're being very selective in sort of where we pick and choose. Uh, and all of it we do in, in consultation with the health director and with district doctors. Great. Right. Thank you for clarifying. Okay. All right. Uh, so we move on to the statement of accounts, Dr. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Hi, Chris. Bye, Maura. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, so you have before you tonight the February statement of accounts, uh, which brings us eight months through the fiscal year, six months through the academic year. Um, and it's a very typical report that we have this year despite the fact that we're in the middle of COVID. But I would say, um, just listening to the presentations tonight and the principles that have come before, that these resources that you have in front of you in the detail really enable a lot of the good work that's taken place in the schools this year and every year. So it's without these type of resources and how they're allocated 
and appropriated for the purposes that meet the board's goals and objectives, it would be difficult at, at best to have achieved what we've achieved this year. So I hope that you keep that in mind as you take a look at our expenditures and really understand the fact that um, the focus of our resources, our decision-making really are rooted in the board's goals and objectives, their budget assumptions, and the directives and the, the things that we needed to accomplish this year for the pandemic. Now we did receive $1.9 million from the boards um, this past year for the pandemic. 250 of that was uh, reimbursed through the ESSER grants and the CRF. Um, but that was instrumental in terms of our ability to meet our needs. But within this budget itself, there's another 600,000 approximately that we expect to spend um, through the end of the year to meet other COVID related expenditures. At this point in the year, we are very similar to prior years with the exception of that, having spent 56% of our budget and covered 37% with a remaining unallocated balance of 7% of our budget. And just as a reminder, I think I remind the board similarly every year that um, a good chunk of our budget is expended in the very end of June for the balloon payments that go out to the board, to the, to the um, staff, for the teaching staff. And so that is in the area of $8 million every year. You're gonna see when you go through the report, there are some accounts within objects that are overexpended, specifically in the property services area. Um, there are a few that we um, areas that we had to um, address, but we do have funds within those objects uh, in other areas such as um, non-instructional equipment repairs to cover those expenses. So at this point, we don't expect any um, significant transfers within between objectives, uh, objects um, through the end of the year. All in all, we do continue to track towards our expected year in balance um, and perhaps even um, improve upon what we expect to have remaining at year end. And that really depends on how um, progressive we are with opening different things towards the end of the year. We're all full in right now at the end of this week, which is great. Actually phenomenal news. We're very happy about that. Uh, spring sports are gonna go off as planned, which I think is just awesome for the children. And um, other things will uh, perhaps also progress like VPA and those types of things that initially we thought we were going to be holding back on. So if there's any questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Dr. Keating. Okay, uh, budget update. Uh, Dr. Letsy and Dr. Keating, do you want to provide an update? And we'll go from there. Yeah, I'll be glad to uh, share a high level update. Glad to do it. Um, and it, did, it just didn't make sense to give a budget update and then a statement of accounts, Dr. Keating. So that's why statement of accounts wasn't the last item in our reports and recognition as usual. Uh, the, well, good thing so, Bill wasn't here. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the Board of Finance, um, two weeks ago, completed their review of the Board of Education's budget, as you're aware, uh, over the course of the time from the initial to the uh, approved uh, Board of Finance budget, which is now being moved on to the Town Council beginning Tuesday night. Um, there was, was quite a bit of discussion, I know, between the Board of Education and the Board of Finance, and ultimately the Board of Finance made the decision uh, at this point not to fund in the budget the about $3.2 million worth uh, from the Board of Education's request. Uh, their conversation around that included uh, the COVID uh, expenditures that are budgeted for the, the district next year. Uh, no, with an expectation, as, as you recall, um, that COVID would still have a, a significant enough impact on our school system for the first half of the year, that we would still be uh, needing some additional custodians and some additional building substitutes. We've only just now begun having uh, welcoming one or two daytime substitutes into the building. There st still seems to be quite a bit of reluctance from the itinerant substitutes to taking jobs. So that's where those building subs have been so helpful. Um, the other uh, 
explanation for the reduction of the 3.2 was related to insurance and a uh, reticence to fu fully fund the actuarially derived expectations for anticipated claims next year and um, discussion of the corridor and uh, no, that, no longer having the Board of Ed hold the insurance reserves, which again is that corridor between 100% of anticipated claims and 120% of anticipated claims, uh, which the Board of Education is responsible for in the event that the insurance goes above those anticipated claims. And we've had a policy or an agreement with the town for the, since 2014-15 where the town would hold a portion of those reserves, the Board of Ed would hold a portion of it, and combined the entire corridor of 20% of the anticipated claims. So it's everything from 101% up to 120% was held between the two, uh, in or just in order to backstop the plan and as a risk mitigation strategy. So they talked about taking all of that onto the Board of Finances uh, ledger, so to speak. Important to note, of course, that the Board of Education's budget is, is one number and one item. And while they, there can be rationale for reductions, ultimately it is the decision of the Board of Education as to the allocation of the funds that are available in the appropriation granted by the town. Uh, the, the next step with our budget is to go to the town council tomorrow night. Uh, tomorrow night's meeting, which begins at seven o'clock and is a virtual meeting, actually follows a public hearing on, I think, some zoning regulation changes. Uh, but then at seven o'clock, the meeting will begin uh, with public comments. And then there is an opportunity for the chair of the Board of Finance to spend it's a 15 minute item on the agenda to give an overview of the budget and a summary and assessment to the town council as the Board of Finance hands the budget to the town council. And then there's a budget overview um, where you know, Linda, the um, town CFO, would give a, a budget overview and then the Board of Ed has an opportunity to, to speak and to share the Board of Education's budget for, for approximately an hour with the town council. So that's all tomorrow night. Um, and then we will work through March to respond to the town council's questions and help them to develop a, a clear and deep understanding of our budget and the needs for our requests and, uh, and work through the month of, of March with the goal, of course, by the end of March, having um, providing enough information and feedback for the town council to feel that they can make an informed decision about the budget to move forward. Thank you, Dr. Lutze. And I'll just add that the resources committee of the board, we um, met last week following the board of finances vote uh, to review the outcome of that vote and, you know, and what Dr. Lexi just summarized um, so well. And we were troubled by the approach. So um, we've been working and we will be following up as well. So any- I just uh, let me clarify, comments? I'm sorry, one thing. Let me just clarify. I, I said 3.2, it's 3.1, just to yeah. be completely clear. Cause it was, uh, it was around 900,000 for COVID that was in the budget for that half year. And then um, 1. 1 million below the anticipated claims number. And then uh, 1.1 million was the, the risk corridor amount. Um, you know, that's the 8% the of the overall plan. Thank you. And my dog agrees. Okay. Diana? Thanks, uh, Dr. Lutze, for the update. And um, I think it's just, it's very disappointing as, as a, you know, long-term board member and having watched this process play out over a number of cycles to sort of see an unelected board, um, you know, make a decision uh, that is contrary to a negotiated signed agreement between the Board of Education and uh, the town. And, um, you know, it, it just, it's, it's a really, um, I think it, it's, it's a new and not a great place um, to put our boards um, going forward. So it, it, it was a really disappointing year. Penny. So I was very disappointed in the process. I think that the 3.1 million in cuts is really serious. 
I think it could potentially lead to significant cuts in our operating budget if uh, and in the services we give to students if we don't sort this out with other boards. Um, I think as a board of ed, I think we're going to have to look at all of our rights and responsibilities and obligations to the students and the teachers in the district. We need the ability when we set our budget to have a legal right to draw on all the funds that we're counting on for COVID, for health insurance, and for uh, supporting our teachers and students. And I don't believe that the budget that the Board of Finance passed did this. So I'm sorry we're in this position. I think we will, we have worked collaboratively with Board of Finance and the Town Council over many, many years to create a phenomenal school district. So I believe we'll have to do this again. And um, I'm hopeful that we'll get there. But right now, uh, the Board of Education budget is in a, not in a good place. Any other, Sherry? Yeah, I just want to um, add on to what both Deanna and Penny just said so well, but it's just really, um, <laughs> it's downright frustrating that at a time when we should be lauding and celebrating our district, which has handled the past pandemic year so exceptionally, um, I think honestly, you know, we're one, a few of the, in the state, probably even in the nation that's been able to really steer through this pandemic so well that at the time when we should be lauding our our our, our district and our, our administration that we're having this conversation and it almost feels a little bit um, dishonest like that Deanna pointed out that that the board of finance is going contrary to a signed agreement and like I also have been on the board now for eight years I remember the the painstaking detail that the town bodies went through to discuss and rediscuss and you know type out and then revise and and finally agree and sign on this document and it almost feels um, dishonest to me personally and it feels like it's being pushed through kind of quietly at a time when you know town meetings are on Zoom and for obvious reasons a lot of parents aren't able to participate and really follow along in terms of what's happening. And, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's beyond um, disappointing. So I just want Dr. Lutze and everyone here to know that, um, you know, from as a board of ed member, we support you, we support, you know, the budget as is. I mean, you're doing an exceptional job. We're trying to do our job as the board of ed. And now I guess it's just a plea to the town bodies to let us do our job. Thanks, Sherry. Bob. So uh, thanks for the update. I'd like to get a little more information on what the $3.1 uh, million, dollars, what, where those pieces are exactly. I know the there was like 900K in COVID. And um, I know that the CRF Act, you couldn't get a reimbursement if it was budgeted. So it seems, to, seems not, is that not true, Diana? No, uh, that's um, that's not true, Bob. I think that was a misunderstanding early with the um, the Sierra funds. Generally, I'll, po I'll uh, put it. I'll that, post it in the link. I'll have the link right here. I'll post it up. Sure. There's an FAQ from the, the state. Uh, so if that's not true, and I don't know, you know, maybe the website's wrong, but that, that's what it says on the website for the state. Um, I'll read it to you. It says CARES Act specifies that the CRF can be used only for necessary expenditures due to COVID, public health emergency, costs that were not budgeted, and costs incurred between March and December 20th. So, you know, I think uh, maybe that's wrong. You guys can, uh, you know, fill me in if I'm not. But um, so anyway, that if that's true, then it seems to be a precedent. Maybe you don't want to budget the COVID numbers until you know what the uh, what the state's going to do about reimbursement because otherwise you're just disqualify yourself on reimbursement. I don't know. Um, do you want, do you want us to address that Bob or? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Cause we have to take, we've looked into this a bit. Joanne, you're welcome to um, jump in if you like. Oh, but we can't. You're on mute. Oops. Yeah. Oops. I, know. I, got, I got you. There's two parts to the CARES Act. One is the CRF mm -hmm. and one is ESSER. So last year when the first part of CARES was um, approved and passed through to law, uh, districts were not budgeting for the pandemic because they weren't aware of it at the time budgets went through. Mm -hmm. So that initial language 
um, did apply, but it was, they did allow reimbursement. So in other words, if you spent money, unlike other grants where you have to get the grant approved and then you spend the money, if you spent the money, you could ask for reimbursement uh, because you needed to use those funds in order to start your school year. Now, as we move forward and got into the summer last year, they issued um, a, an F and Q on the ESSER because the CRF was a one-time piece of the CARES Act. Mm -hmm. The ESSER is now going into a phase two. And with regards to ESSER, there is no um, supplement or supplanting requirements on the grant. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you can go retroactively and there is no budgeting component to that. So um, that is the change. I mean, it's a fluid process because of the fact that uh, this the pandemic came in in March, April, when most budgets were set. But um, it's not something where now that we know about the pandemic, cannot move forward and say, this is our estimate of expenditures. And oh. that's actually the responsible stewardship kind of thing to do right now. And that's oh. what we did. What are other districts doing? There's a combination. It's, it really is, um, you know, it, it really depends on the district and where they stand with ESSER funds. I mean, you have districts in the state of Connecticut that are getting tens of millions of dollars. Uh, so they're, gonna, they're running it through a grant. Our approach was to say, this is what we need to um, have in funding in order to continue the um, mitigation strategies we've used this year into the first um, semester of next year. And that's how we planned forward. Now we may get grants in and we do know of an ESSER grant that's coming in for 450. Mm -hmm. That's going to help offset a portion of that, if not all of it. But it doesn't mean that you can't or shouldn't move forward with a plan on how to use funds and what you're going to need. And what was uh, uh, just, and the BOF said they would backstop it though. Or is that true? I, I thought I saw that. In the in the paper, BOF. What, um, what's the, what's their stand? What's their stance? They, they're saying that they'll uh, approve special appropriations for the amounts. Um, the there are several layers of challenges with that, including the special appropriation process takes a long period of time and includes other boards as well. Um, so it's not, you know, one board can't say that they're going to do something that other boards also need to vote and be involved with whatever, but they are saying that they would, uh, approve or review through special appropriation to fund, um, there's some issues with that, that I think we'll be talking about a little bit later. Okay. Uh, Deanna has been raising, you, know, you raise your hand. So, earlier. um, yeah, two, two things. One, and Joanne, um, if you could, or Dr. Keating, sorry, um, if you could, um, you know, maybe address another part of, uh, Bob's comment. Um, I think some of the confusion, Bob, about, you know, the budgeting and needing and not being able to budget was some other districts nearby, um, were confused on that language and took a different approach. And so, um, but, you know, we're fortunate that we have people that, you know, are really adept at reading statute and, um, and how things really should work. And so we've been very lucky. Sorry, sorry about that, guys. Um, and, um, and then the other thing, and Brian, I won't, I won't go into it too much because I think you're right. We'll, we'll talk about it later. But, um, you know, it is not an effective way to budget um, by special appropriation. It doesn't allow the district to plan. We know we're gonna have COVID expenses. You know, um, that's why they were put in the budget. We know we'll have them. And that's, you know, um, and what what the Board of Finance is asking us to do is to come back. You know, we'll have to go back in April or May to ask for these, these funds because you can't plan for the, the beginning of the school year um, on a special appropriation, but it's not fair to the families. It's not fair to the families. You know, um, it's just, it's not a, I don't know anybody that budgets this way. So. Okay. Oh, Penny, go ahead. So I would just say in my experience on the board, the only time that we ever intentionally overspent our budget was when we were faced with the emergency situation last year to prepare the schools for the pandemic. 
And we actually went to the town bodies and said, we'd like you to give us this money. And they said, well, wait till you know exactly what it's for. And that's what we did. Um, but that's the only time. So every other time for all of our regular operating expenses that we knew we were going to have for all of our insurance expenses that, are, that had been estimated by our actuaries um, and that allowed us to continue on the path of having um, being self-insured, which carries certain risks. Uh, but actually has been the best way and the most cost-effective way to deliver health insurance. So in this budget that's presented to us tonight, it's the only time that we have not had the legal right to get draw down all the funds that we need to cover all of our expenses. And that's why I think it's a very dangerous place for the board to be, and, and we'll have to continue discussions with the town bodies. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Right. So unless anyone else has anything else to say on that, we're going to move forward. We still have a number of agenda items. Okay. Our action items, we have two donations to hear about tonight. Uh, the first one is the high school sign and table donation. And I think we have some the New Canaan High School PFA here to present, or maybe Mr. Egan. I am um, going to bring... Mr. Egan over without warning. And uh, I think you said Jody as well, Bill? Yes. And Jody's on her way. Excellent. Okay. Um, I don't know if you're planning to share the presentation. You're welcome to, or you're welcome to just speak to. Uh, we did share the presentation with the board this afternoon. Uh, and um, I can you, pull you it can, up for you if that's easier. Uh, you give me sharing privileges. That's fine. You have them. I will say, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I will say this, you know, I, it's always a privilege to be able to present before the board. I think this was maybe set up this way that I would wait until after Joanne did the statement of accounts. She didn't think I was on, but she wanted me to hear the whole thing. So I think that's why we did it this way so that I would make sure she was uh, heard by me tonight. Joanne, always wonderfully done. All right, let me go to my presentation here. Can everybody see my screen? Probably not. I don't think I shared it. That's good because I didn't share it. Sorry for my technical difficulties here. I'm back. How about that? Now I hit share screen would be helpful. There you go. All righty. All right. So first of all, I want to thank uh, all of you for having us here this evening uh, to talk about a couple of exciting things. The PFA have been wonderful contributors and, um, you know, uh, continually enhancing the culture of, of the high school. And I want to thank them again before we even present tonight. So uh, we are looking to add a sign uh, on the farm road sign. You know, since I got there, this is, uh, you know, been working on the beautification and different aspects of the building. Uh, but one of the things that has kind of been lacking was a uh, sign on Farm Road. If you drive up Farm Road, you really do not uh, wouldn't necessarily know what school this is. So if we have plenty of visitors that come in and they drive up, and you know, sometimes we'll hear, "Is is that the school? Sachs, the high school? No, no, this is the high school." Um, so we're looking to uh, add a sign on the Farm Road uh, sign. That uh, would look. This is a rendering from Hungwell Signs. This is the vendor that we're thinking about using. Uh, that was actually looking at an aluminum rendering. Uh, we're looking at, at plastic in this, the similar, um, different color, but the same person who did the back wall on the Dunning side, I think that's our, my next thing, um, would be, oh, I have my old slide here. Sorry, I apologize. The home of the Ram sign on the back, he's the same vendor who did that. Um, looking at the color still, uh, maybe a darker scale if we're doing the same plastic letters, we'd be more, more in the gray black scheme. Um, but the locations, uh, sorry, would be the front of the sorry for my lack of technical expertise tonight. Uh, the front of the building on the farm road sign. So that's the first thing that we're looking at. And the second thing that we'd be looking at is some outdoor seating. So this year during the pandemic, uh, we realized how much, uh, the students really used outdoors and we wanted to expand the cafeteria area outside. So the PFA is graciously, graciously donating 
uh, about 20 tables to these areas out back. So if you go outside the cafeteria doors, there's the senior courtyard. Out in front of the senior courtyard is the area on the left. Uh, we also have on the side, there's a couple of uh, grassy areas uh, that we're looking to add tables to. The kinds of tables that we were a mixture of round and uh, rectangle. About 20, uh, I think, Jody, we have the next slide. We have the exact number. It looks like we have about uh, 22 tables, a couple of which will probably be um, handicap accessible. And the total amount of all donations, including the farm road sign, for us is about $32,708. Um, do you want to stop and ask questions about these particular items, or do you want to go on to Dave's piece and then come back to this? Let's stop with you guys because we have a motion and all to uh, finish up. And then, Bill, I'll leave you here so you can drive, and we'll, we'll have Dave uh, join us after. Sounds good. Any, any comments or questions on this presentation? Penny. I think these are um, really fantastic improvements, and I think it'd be wonderful to get a sign on the high school. The one question I had was, um, it was interesting. The most comments I think I got after being on the high school building committee were the improvement we made to that wall that's where you're going to put the sign, the fact that we actually painted it white and actually it looks a lot better. If you look at where the sign is placed now, it, it's sort of an awkward wall because, um, you know, it's not even. So you, you put the sign so it's parallel and then there's, you know, different levels of cement above it. So I'm not artistic. I don't understand where the best placement of the sign would be. Uh, but I was just wondering what process you had gone through with designers to sort of say, is, is this the best place for the sign for the high school? We did have designers look at it. it. It would actually be centered a little bit higher than this rendering. This rendering was done by Hungwell. Um, but it would be centered and, and centered on the, um, uh, I guess I'm looking for the, the cutout there. So it would go up in between the two spots. So it'd be up a little higher than it is now. So it'd be centered on the top half of that. Like if you looked at the back um, piece, I guess it would be the Dunning side. While we wouldn't have the same painted stripe back there, if I could get to it, let me see. It's centered on that back area, that top part. It would be centered like that too. So this is only a, a rendering of that, but it would be centered on that top part. I'm not sure if I'm explaining that uh what you're asking for there. When you say so, center, it's not going to be parallel to the top of the roof, though. I mean, right now it's not. It's sort of set back. It's parallel to, I guess it's, you know, dead even or something. It would be more dead even. So it would be up, I don't know, call it four or five inches from where it is now, but not on the line. Right now it's centered on, or I guess, uh, to that line right there, but makes it looks off a little. It looks like it's a, a little bit askew or off a little hmm. bit, but... So um, I'm going to jump in, Bill, if I can. If I, I'm just curious on this topic, Penny, and I'm, I'm curious because as you're saying that, uh, actually, Bill, go back to the full the slide. One? Again. No, oh. this one. Just go to present for me. Um, I'm. That's my question was going to be because it's on the line. I think it looks straight, regardless of what's above it, because it's it's straight on the line. Mm -hmm. I was, I was even, I think if you would go above the line, you might lose that and it might look more like it's not straight given the way the top goes. Does that make sense? So my question was going to be, is that line visible from the road? And I, I believe it, it is, is, but you would know it better. So I good. guess I would suggest maybe, again, I'm not a designer certainly, but talking with them about the, this concern and see if, since that line's visible and it's resting right on the line, does that sort of give the, um, make it more obviously straight? And then it looks like the roof slopes up, which it does. Whereas if it was raised up and kind of floating, it might look like it's crooked. In the roof. I gotcha. <laughs> we'll follow up with the designer and see, and see what the best call is on that. I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. And that could just say, be, you'll, get, oh, God. you'll get a lot of comments. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I know there's no doubt about that, Penny. Yeah. <laughs> Deanna, but I, I do, 
even raising those comments, I just wanted to thank the PFA and the parents for making these amazing donations that so improve the look and quality of our schools. It's just fantastic. And I'm so appreciative as a Board of Ed member um, for all you do uh, for our students. Um, as am I. I mean, honestly, I can't thank uh, Jody and Courtney enough and the, the rest of the PFA because they're continually enhancing the culture uh, for the kids and the community. No, well, the, the thanks goes to all of you guys, really. You're the ones fighting the fight. We're just trying to bring a little happy here and there. <laughs> <laughs> you bring a lot of happy. Yeah. Deanna? Yeah, I was I was actually going to uh, agree with Brian, um, and and not just because of the line, but you also have a door, um, uh, the the top of the door there, which is probably parallel to that line, whatever was put in there. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think I think it looks fine the way it is, and yes, there is a gap at the top, but um, you know, I think it would look stranger if it was trying to trying to follow the roof line of the of the building itself. Certainly, thanks. One more opinion that bring <laughs> in. I won't add my opinion on that, but uh, I will say <laughs> outdoor tables. I don't know what I, I don't know, but I will say the outdoor tables are such a gift to the students. I think it's great, especially we've learned this year, you know, how nice it is to be outdoors and to take advantage when the weather permits um, here in Connecticut. So uh, I think it's, it's awesome for the kids to have another place to eat or, uh, you know, have time outdoors to socialize. Take a break. Well, Thank you. And honestly, it's just going to give so many more permanent tables. You know, right now we're using these Costco tables that are outside the little folding tables that just aren't going to have any permanent still. Great. Thank you. You know what? I'm okay. Sorry. I one, one question about the tables. What do, what do you do during um, weather? Do you have the, the custodians bring them in during extreme weather? Because, I mean, I don't or how are they? Are they going to be bolted down? Uh, these are heavy tables and made for the outdoors. Uh, so okay. they're not going to go anywhere in the elements. I mean, certainly right now with I'm the tables that we're using. Wind, not, not, not rain and what, you know. Uh, the umbrellas, the umbrellas have to be brought down or else they'll okay. snap. That is something we've seen with the ones that we have. Uh, so they have to be kind of folded down. The tables themselves won't, won't move. They're, okay. they're definitely solid enough uh, to, to stay. It's, it's, but again, like with the ones we have now, they have to go in and out all the time. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. So do I have a motion to approve a donation of $32,708.13 by the high school PFA for sign and seating? Brendan, second, Deanna, all in favor? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Next up is SAC with Mr. Gessich and the SACS PTC. Okay. Thank you, Jody. I'm going to uh, change you back to attendee. <laughs> and let me bring Dave over here. Let's see. Hello, Dave. Good evening. And I don't, I did, don't think I saw one of your PTC reps on the other side. Yeah, I, I'm not sure they were uh, going to be here this evening. So I said I'd be okay. happy to step up. All right. I'm, always are. I'm driving you the bus up. for you, Dave. Just tell me when it, to move on. I was going to say thank you. I do appreciate that. And uh, I, I don't have a whole lot to add uh, in terms of what was already stated in terms of the purpose for this particular proposal, other than to continue to provide opportunities for our students to uh, take advantage of some of the outdoor spaces that we are so fortunate to have at and around SACS. Uh, this particular courtyard, uh, one of five courtyards at SACS, uh, is one that we are going to be focusing on giving a little attention to. It currently has some tables that are, um, they've been out there, they've been used for instruction over the years for some of the art, cl art classes. They happen to be adjacent to the uh, gymnasiums that we've been using as cafeterias. So we piloted in the fall utilizing these tables um, with some success that the students were gonna be uh, able to use this space during the lunch waves. So of the four lunch waves for grades four, uh, five, six, seven, and eight. Um, and we didn't have enough for everybody. So that's part of this proposal. We were gonna do 
uh, enough tape or be able to get enough tables to be able to have an entire team out there. And we would work a rotation around of when they would be out there. Um, although today's weather didn't necessarily reflect what it's going to be like being out there. I think last Thursday and Friday gave us a little bit of a dose of um, being able to take advantage of some of the days that are, that are ahead here. So um, that's that one space that we are looking at. Bill, if you don't mind just advancing one slide. Um, the other areas uh, outside the lower division entrance, and we have some areas there that we would look to utilize, uh, probably not with those. The newer tables are going to be designated for their courtyard area, but it's going to allow us to utilize some of those other tables to be able to uh, put outside, whether it be for uh, eating or whether it be for classes continuing to utilize these outdoor spaces for um, instruction and experiences outside. So uh, the interior courtyard right at, inside the main lobby is what's pictured at the top there. And it does have a few of those tables um, that are going to be purchased. Uh, as Bill said, they're extremely heavy. Uh, they do not move at all. They're definitely all weather. Um, so they're extremely sturdy uh, and actually weather very well. Those have been there since uh, since I've been there for the last few years. And uh, they look just about as new as the day that um, I had seen them. So they do hold up pretty well. Um, so if you don't mind going to the last, that's just another closer shot of what the tables look like. The umbrella would go in the middle with the stand in the middle as well. Uh, we're proposing those 12 tables. Two of those would be handicap or wheelchair accessible uh, for the inevitable times that we have students who are either on crutches, need a little extra space, or uh, with some of our students who may be in a wheelchair. Um, and then the accessories would include the umbrellas and the stands for a total cost of uh, 15700 And, um, you know, we're grateful to be able to package this deal. It's kind of like the uh, American Pickers, the bundle with us in the high school to be able to um, have the advantage of some of the shipping uh, and savings that come along with that. So we do appreciate the uh, consideration with that. Great, thank you, Mr. Gessich. Mm -hmm. Questions, comments? I think it's a great addition. I um, I think that courtyard has really just come along beautifully and it's such a nice space to be outdoors and uh, for the students. I love, I've seen the pictures in the newsletters of the kids doing art outside and that's just a, it's a great spot. So great. thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you and to the SACS PTC. And uh, also to all of you as well, so thank you. Thanks. Uh, is there a motion to approve a donation of $15,700 by the Sachs Middle School PTC Outdoor Tables? I'll second um, Brian's dog. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Bob, second. <laughs> Sherry, all in favor? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Bill. Okay. All right. Great. Comments from the public. Is there anyone wishing to address the board? So please raise your hand. Uh, we have one here. Let's see. Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer Dallapi, you, yes. yep, we can hear Hi. you. Thank you, good evening. Okay, you know, I've been doing this for two years with you all and I still get nervous, so here it goes. In an attempt to use our time well, I won't repeat the details from the petition that was shared with you all earlier today, but it's clear that grave mistakes have been made when it comes to the start time proposal. When the cost doubled, it was a perfect time to hit pause and find a solution that supports the overwhelming majority of students and family and local businesses in town. There is time still to right the wrong. Per comments just earlier from this board, it's disappointing in a time when parents have hardly had time to follow along that this unfavored solution was quietly pushed through. COVID will eventually be behind us and people's full focus will come back to the critical everyday health and wellness of their children. You can determine your legacy. Your legacy can continue to fly in the face of all science, global, national, local best practices, or you can be the board and administration and have a legacy of humility, rationality, and, courageous, and, and courage in that of, and that of being progressive. Start times is ongoing. 
COVID is a terrible and awful moment in our time. I do not believe in letting good stand in the way of perfect. We aren't even close to good, just looking at your own research. You have time and the ability to live up to the full expectations of those who elected you and provide for the students whose education you shepherd. Have courage and do what is right. Be able to be proud, leave a resoundingly strong legacy and reestablish trust in the town across the overwhelming majority. And many of those are too afraid on the subject to even comment. So I talk tonight for them and will continue to do so. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Sorry, um, my dog and I were muted. James, okay. you're, um, you should be all set. Okay, uh, one second. Uh, okay, I just want to, I mean, you heard from me before, but I just want to stress again that I, I'm in support of getting high schoolers more sleep. After all, my kids will hopefully be there one day as well. But other parents view the ability to be present for our young children's daily lives as much more crucial. How this time contributes not only to academic performance, but self-confidence, overall happiness, and so much more. I'm surprised that you would all promote and support this start time proposal, one that no other successful elementary school in all of CT supports. Now, this would be a very drastic change that would affect so many families. Yet I believe the BOE has made almost no effort to provide parents or students the details of this proposal. How can this plan not be conveyed early and clearly to elementary school parents. We receive emails very regularly, but few, if any, seem to even spell out what this change in times would be. Do you not value the feedback you would receive? I honestly believe stakeholders do not support this plan. However, we can easily find out what works best for parents, staff, and high schoolers. Let them decide if this drastic change is the right plan for all. Simply provide the current schedule and the new schedule and ask stakeholders which they prefer. I provided you a mock template earlier today. I don't think that could be any easier, clearer, or more definitive. Why is this not done? Why have we spent tens of thousands of our tax dollars on surveys the BOE either ignores or claims to have no value? Now, I think I'm a fairly reasonable person and certainly don't consider myself vindictive, but realistically, Next winter, as I sit on my daily hour train ride home, I will be thinking of nothing but returning to a quiet home, which was once filled with laughs and giggles. I'll be crushed every Sunday night as I say goodbye to my kids for the week. How passionate do you think parents will be at that stage about this proposal? How vocal do you think we will be about those who have supported this plan? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, now, any announcements in future business? Dr. Lutze? Sure. Uh, just briefly, uh, the our next meeting with the Board of Education is actually not until April 12th. It's almost a month away. And that is due to the calendar and timing with our spring break, uh, which starts um, April 2nd with Good Friday and then runs the week after Easter. Uh, and then we return in. So the next meeting on April 12th will be the first, you know, the, the first Monday after spring break. Uh, we are scheduled for an update from our social studies team Right. So Mary Hannah and Bob Stevenson will be coming to give us an update on some of the, the good work that they've been doing across the district over the last couple of years. Um, and there's certainly connections there with our DEI work and discussions and things that we've, we've had and been having. Uh, the uh, just a uh, observation over the last two meetings between this meeting and our last meeting, we've had every building principal come for one reason or another, whether to share an update or to um, request a donation or what have you. And I think uh, 
I'm feeling a little more return to normalcy there. I think that's a wonderful thing. And uh, it's been good to see them at the meetings. So the between now and April 12th, we're going to be seeing, I think, a lot of each other. Uh, maybe just not at Board of Ed meetings in whole, but we'll have those town council meetings and other opportunities to be uh, talking together as well. So looking forward to it. Great. Thank you. Uh, in a moment, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn into executive session uh, with the board. So the board will leave. We will have a private link uh, for our executive session, and then we will return uh, to complete our agenda. So with that, is there yes. a motion? Oh, I'm sorry, Katrina. Can I just speak to that for just a brief yeah. moment? So for anyone who would like to stay on, this webinar will remain active, although not. it'll just be quiet. And uh, then you know, we'll go out and then we'll come back to this, this same space. Uh, Tony Pachesnik is going to hold the space for us, so to speak, so we don't end the webinar function that we're in the midst of, but so it'll just be a blank screen until we return for anyone, any attendees who would like to hang on. Thank you, Tony, for your help tonight. Um, okay, so is there a motion to adjourn into executive session? Brendan, second, Julie, all in favor? Okay. Thank you. And um, we'll be inviting the Board of Education's attorney uh, from Shipman and Goodwin, Andy Ballack, to join us in the executive session as well. So quick question. Did, did you already send us?